my cell, kind of just learning and talking to guys and, you know, just um, doing what I could to better myself in that respect. But the one thing I was challenged by was really how was the time was the issue of time and the clock. And I, I don't tell having this told the story to many people, but I had a real difficult time gauging uh, a calendar when I was away. And when I got to the place where I was at the prison that I was at, I went and bought five years worth of Q-tips and used a Q-tip a day um, until um, they were all gone. And that's how I kind of gauged the calendar and used time and, right. and not many not many people, a lot of people have a difficult time with, with that. But one of the greatest things that happened was I got to learn about art. Yeah. And my celly was an art, uh, art dealer and was very uh, prolific at understanding art and the nuances of it. And he taught me a lot about it in reading books that he would give me. But it wasn't until um, Charlie Garcia. Charlie Garcia, who was a great guy, uh, was in an art room at the prison I was at and said, you know, you got to try this the most incredible thing if you do it. And he had started me painting and I started painting. And boy, I was so bad. I was, so, <laughs> I was so bad. I was like a little kid, you know, like finger painting. I was as terrible at it. But the time that I spent in the art room just flew by. It just flew right. by. It was like you. I was in another place, like another world, and and it really helped me understand um, mindfulness and finding right. that place where you can just sit and and be just be quiet with your mind. And and it's been incredible. And I still paint at home a little bit. And later on the show, I may show you some some additional photographs, um, some paintings that I did. I'm a little embarrassed by them, especially with some of the guests that are on today. But uh, so Nate, how are you doing? Wait, well, so real quick story about art. So. I never was able to, I was never a good drawer, never able to draw well. And um, I had a friend who, when I was in like the third grade, who drew excellent and he would draw pictures and I would sometimes steal the pictures and say that I drew them. I'll bring them <laughs> home and show my parents and say I drew them. So he had drew this one picture and it was a picture of a, of a man's face and it was like really detailed and everything. So I took the picture, I brought it home and I showed my mom and dad the picture. I'm like, yeah, I drew this in school. And it was a picture of a serial killer from the newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously <laughs> seriously my dad was like that's a picture we just saw <laughs> and i stole a picture from the guy said i drew it i didn't draw it never really knew how to draw but draw uh, and uh me and him are, we're good friends to this day we talked about that a couple times and laughed <laughs> you know i was just glad you didn't say that's what got you into into uh behind the walls that would be really bad <laughs> no uh, but so I'm, I'm grateful to be here. Um, thank you, everybody. We have a great show. We have a few people on. I think Lou Narvaez is going to try and get on today. We're, we're going to give uh, get Lou on at some point in time. We also have some great guests. Um, Cynthia Primus and David Goodman um, from Idea Arts in, in Camden are going to be on. It's a remarkable program that's servicing young people, and I'm really excited about bringing them on. I was over at their facility not long ago, and they're going to share all, this, all the good work that they're doing. And Sean Hargrove is here. Sean um, is a graduate of the Mural Arts Program and also has been doing some remarkably remarkable things and Sean's going to tell you a little about his art projects and his company he started and the work that he's doing and his family and we'll hear Sean's story as well so we're going to um we're going to take a quick break um and we're going to be very right back with looking forward uh Philadelphia we're really excited about the show and we'll be right back all right I guess we're back. We are, we're back. So we're. So. We're cutting back into music. All right. We can edit that. Charlie, you want to cut into the music for a sec? Y'all ready? Alright, folks. Let's go. I put your hands in the sky, went inside the side. We ain't going nowhere, we just waving bye bye. All of the haters, to all the haters, to all of the haters. Like, I'll see you later. Let's go. Let's go. Go time, time to be the change. change. Set the world on fire. Flame. Flame. Rise higher, level up, do the thing Flame. Shine brighter, be a fighter, push through the pain Place a trail, lend a helping hand Represent, take a stand Change the game, stick it to the plan Hold tight, shine bright, that's who I am And I don't know though, what you have been told though All I know though, is going for the gold though Give my all, I'm a heart, I'm a soul though don't break down I put your hands in the sky Went side to side We ain't going nowhere We just waving bye-bye All of the haters To all the haters To all of the haters We all see you later 
It's for older world, anything is my best And that's what you get when I'm just myself So I refuse to switch or adjust myself Hey, I got the cheat code, yeah, I got the cheat code It's so easy, it's just to be me though I got the cheat code, yeah, I got the cheat code It's so easy Hey, we are back. This is Looking Forward. And Nate, we are back again. It's our first break. I will tell you, the song you just heard was from Saul Paul, a good friend of mine, who nice. was a Just Leadership Fellow, a returning citizen, and is rocking it out in Austin, Texas. He is doing some great children's songs, and uh, just his, his songs have skyrocketed through a number of the charts. I'm really excited about Saul Paul. He was a uh, hosted guest um our featured guest, musical guest last week. And I promised him I'd get his music on a little bit more to highlight some of the great stuff he's doing. So you may hear from him later on. Um, nice. So I'm not sure. I think I'd like to go to our first guest. I'm not sure if Mr. Narvaez is here, but if not, let's hop into um, Cynthia and uh, Cynthia Primus and David Goodman. Uh, are you guys here from Idea Arts? Charlie, you want to bring him in the studio? We'll give him a second. It's all about art. And I think we're, there we go. We're getting them there. One more second. So I had the um, I had the privilege of going into Idea Arts over in Camden. There, Cynthia, how are you? How are you? It's good to see you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I so I love, I love, love, love your studio there that you have and what you've done with it. But why don't you tell us first who are you and tell me a little bit about how you got started with Idea Arts. Wow, Jeffrey, first of all, thanks so much for inviting me on. Um, it's always a pleasure. Um, just looking forward to uh, getting to know you a little bit more since we've met. Um, the arts have been part of my life from the very beginning. Um, I discovered that my mother was an artist and my brother was a commercial artist. My mother was an artist when she was 68 years old. Wow. And wow. at 68, what, 65, she retired and she started painting and doing her own, you know, exhibits and all of that. She passed away three years later at 68. Mm -hmm. But before she passed away, she drew um, paintings and, um, you know, art for each one of her kids. I'm the baby of seven. And so I always remembered her her um, freedom, you know, was really about freedom that after she raised all of her family, she decided to focus on herself. And so, um, you know, sort of flash forward and all of that, um, I founded IDEA, which stands for Institute for the Development of Education in the Arts, uh, 25 years ago. Wow, that well, actually, long ago. I know it's been around for a while. That yeah. is really well. Wow. <laughs> and so, um, so, one of my mentors was Portia Spur from Please Touch the Museum uh, in okay. Philadelphia. Okay. She was the one that encouraged me to start the nonprofit. And IDEA um, really took off from there. We've, we've had so many different experiences, but the whole purpose of the organization was really to use the arts as a mechanism for healing and change. So it's so true. There, there's a definition of um of art that, as someone just has described it as the art is a process of of the or the product of deliberately arranging elements in a way that appeals to senses or emotions. It encompasses a diverse range of human activities, creations, and modes of expression, including music and literature. And your place where you are in Camden um, does it all. It touches it all. So tell us a little bit about. Um, first of all, we got heard a little bit of how you got started, but how did you end up where you are today? Well, we um, originally, in 2008, we were offered, before that time, we were um, working sort of, um, you know, as a hybrid. We would go into the school district and bring our artists and, you know, work with the kids um, that were in alternative school situations. And right. um, when we would bring our team of artists, um, the district and, you know, the community would find out the power of the arts by the things that we were doing with these kids. And we were helping the kids to, you know, their attendance would go up 25%. You know, those kids who wanted to drop out decided not to. We have kids who went on to college and graduate school 
because we sort of harness that project based learning. You know, they did anything from, you know, documentary movies to comic books to, you know, um, writing music for to score scores for um, the documentary movie, you know, um, poetry, you know, all those things that tapped into their creative, their creativity. Right. So um, we in 2008, we were invited to move into the defunct, the old South Jersey Performing Arts Center on the Camden waterfront. And we were able from 2008 to 2016 to manage that black box theater. Um, like I said, it was a 136 seat theater. And we sort of became that mecca for the community yeah, yeah. Um, where a lot of the arts organizations in Camden in particular and, and through the Camden area outside of Camden will come and utilize the, the, um, the theater. And we had so many different you know, people that walked through the door, international, national, local artists. Um, in 2016, my landlord at the time um, <laughs> decided that the rent was going to go up to $4,000. And of course, as a nonprofit, we couldn't afford that. So um, in 2016, um, we ended the the um, you know the lease. But before we left, we did um, what we call the Legacy Awards. The first time that, um, as an organization, um, and also as in, in the community, that we recognized about 40 artists from Camden. And these artists were Grammy Award winners and international, you know, um, artists. And we did this art, this sort of, you know, award ceremony. And so we left in 2016. And from 2016 to 2020, we have been searching uh, for a permanent spot. And, you know, thanks to organizations like Rowan University and Rutgers and Camden County College, we did have some space to do some of our programming, but not fully. And right. then in 2019, um, we found this particular place downtown and the Michaels organization, which is one of the biggest developers in the area in Camden, um, did this layout for us for free. Um, in addition, Subaru um, Foundation gave us money to um, pretty much buy equipment like um, TV production equipment, graphic design equipment, music production and sound engineering. And so um, the Michaels group, you know, helped us build out this small studio. We have a um, sound studio in the back. We have, a, um, you know, our TV production. We have a stage here where we have open mic and, right. and you know, jazz. Uh, once a month, um, and we have a, a big table here that I'm sitting at where we do graphic design and art with um, our students. So we know the power of the arts and the creative spirit. And you guys so are just stayed around. Yeah, you guys are just starting too. You're just you're just starting to to kick it in Camden because I was there uh, recently and walked had a tour of the of the studio there and the sound room. Uh, but mo what impressed me was number one, it, it's just in a great location. It's right in the heart downtown in Camden. And <laughs> what's even better is your backyard. I mean, they have this backyard that's just incredible. That just is so ripe for like outdoor concerts and right. art projects and all the whole thing that could go on back there. I'm really excited about can't wait for it to get nice out. So to see what you guys do with the back so, of the house. A, a question I would ask us, well, bef before COVID, how often did you have events at your studios? Um, before COVID, actually, we were slated to open up in April of oh, 2020. Okay. So have COVID you been having, up, I'm sorry. And we were, we were slated to open up. In, right. in April. So, you know, we also had um, within 2018, 2019, we were waiting for another space that fell through. Okay. So that was how long we were waiting to be able to have our own home. And oh, cool. this, yeah. yeah. So what's the ages? What, what are the ages of the people that you see in your programs? Um, 
if we have our Saturday classes, we have kids from seven to 13 or 12. They come in and they do visual arts. They do drama. Um, we haven't started the dance on Saturdays, but we certainly, you know, um, we haven't promoted anything. We've had parents walk through the door and say, listen, I need, to, I need a place to, right. for my kids to be creative. Um, after school, we're, you know, for older kids between 15 to 20, um, we offer TV production uh, training and filmmaking and TV production um, training and music uh, production using Logic Pro software and graphic design using Photo um, Shop. We're looking to work with Rutgers so that they can show the kids how to do animation, 3D animation. Um, during the summer, we and does um, drones, and he taught the kids how to do. A, so, you know, anything that we're filming that we use drone for, you know, awesome. that so those we, age groups awesome. are really. If you wanted to get to um, yes. to work at the Idea Arts uh, Center for the Arts, um, how would you go about doing it? How do we get hold of you? How do people get out there, um, find out about you? Sure. We are on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, Facebook is Idea Center for the Arts. Um, the Instagram is the idea is idea art center. Um, we are basically, if you get on our website site at www.ideacfta, short for center for the arts, dot org, uh, you can get us. You can call us at 856-210-9394. Um, and then you can email us at idea, I-D-E-A dash arts, A-R-T-S at Comcast.net. So I have to tell you, if you are a young person or yeah. if you're the parent of a young person, you live in Camden or in that area, um, you got to check it out. Just an amazing facility doing great work with young people. And I can't tell you the smile that you see on, on the, the kids' faces when they go in these programs and they just like so thrilled to be there and uh, it's it's so incredible, but they are located at 217 Market Street in Camden. And again, their phone number is 856-210-9394. Um, I know that um, I was wondering, is, is David in the house? David, um, I want you to say hi to Brianna, who's oh, here. Oh, there you go. Hey, hi, Brianna. Brianna. <laughs> that works with us. <laughs> She's there been you with high There school. you go. Hey. There's How David. Know, right? How I'm are good, you, David. Here? I'm doing good. fine. I'm doing fine. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, oh, yeah, we we did. We had we have to. We heard a lot from Cynthia, and now we really want to hear from the brains of the organization right now because <laughs> you're, you're in you're in that room. Turn me, you're turn in that me room. back off, then, and let's sit yeah. <laughs> You're in that the studio room. I'm, I'm just the muscle. I just move stuff around. So why do you think yeah, I have I mean, Nate here? That's <laughs> <laughs> well. Let me tell you this. I'm digging Nate because he's got the right sign behind him. Go he does. Into it. My man. That's what I'm talking about. He does. <laughs> right. That's just because he took his Kansas City Chiefs banner down. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so hold on. You got you're in the room that I love. You're uh you're yeah. you're in the room with all the um all the oh, equipment yeah, and yeah. Uh, the studio room. Really amazing. Yeah. So this is where kids go um when they have um they want to court some music or sure. work on Absolutely. computers and stuff. Yeah, this is our this is our music production room, and uh, we were so fortunate that we got a grant from Subaru. You know, and we call this actually. See if I can see, you see it. We call it the Subaru Media Lab. There you go. Yeah, you know, right. and uh, yeah, this is where we have uh, our iMac computers are all loaded up with um, uh, Logic Pro, and you've got Final Cut Pro on here too, so we can teach kids how to do some video editing. But this is where the magic happens. You know, as far as from the the production side of it they come in here and we've got keyboards they have keyboards there you know stations we've got headphones where they can just sort of really get into doing their thing right here on the computers but cool. yeah, they come in here and they make some they make some good stuff just incredible incredible how many people how many kids do you guys service over there how many people are in a class well in, in this class you can only get you know it's one two like six at a you know, about like six kids at a time 
you know, along with an instructor. And the reason why is because we want them to be able to sort of immerse themselves. I mean, we could do a little bit more, but especially with COVID now, we're very uh, conscious about how many kids we can get in a particular room at a particular time. Yeah, our, I, I was going to ask you, how was your COVID, we call it the COVID pivot. It's going to be a yeah. new dance. Everybody's doing it, but how's it working out for you guys? Well, you know, we're doing things on live stream now, like uh, uh, we'll have a small amount of young people come in, maybe two or three that may come in this room and do some work. Right. Um, and we might interchange that type of a thing. Um, but we're doing things virtually now, too. You know, like we've got, um, you know, our a dance class. We're doing a dance class virtually. We're doing an acting class virtually. Um, our The music production teacher that's here, he does some. Uh, instruction, music production, instruction online as well. So we've tried to adjust, like you said, yeah. doing the COVID dance. We've tried to make that switch as well so we can stay relevant in what's happening and make sure that the arts are get still, you know, that young people still have access to the arts. You know, so, so. so a question would be, once, once a person joins the program, the idea program, how long are they involved within the program as far as like, uh, is there like a time frame that they, did it, they graduate or something like that? Yeah, you know, uh, we have our programming sometimes six, eight weeks. Uh, we do it a couple of ways. Um, mainly most of our programming is is uh, grant funded. So depending right. upon the grant that we get, usually determines how long the program can go. You know, because right. one of the things that we really do, uh, we, we, uh, we insist in a lot of our funding is that there's funding available to give kids some sort of a stipend, yes. you know. Uh, yeah, you know, you know, just to give them something because we want yeah. to sort of create a real life environment. So we hold them accountable. Like if they're late here, you know, um, if they're if they haven't f completed a project, I mean, all that impacts their, you know, their stipend. You know, yeah, cool. So we try to make it a real world, you know, piece. So it can it can range six to eight weeks. It depends. Um, our classes on the Saturdays usually they come in six week periods. So right. the parents pay for a total of six weeks. Kids, they learn, and then you know they can continue on to uh, the next step up or a different class or whatever. Yeah. Well, we are uh, we are really excited to have you on, and and again, yes, it's sir. Idea Idea Center for the Arts. They're located yep. at two seventeen Market Street in Camden, right downtown yep. Camden. You can't miss a beautiful beautiful front uh, of your studio. It's all glass. You can look right in. But if yep. you want to reach them, it's eight five six two one zero nine three nine four or Idea dash arts at comcast.net um well, thank you so much for both of you getting on i know you have a class starting so nate you have some you have a few minutes if you want to jump over there and get in i think it's a dance class it could be yeah good i think i you. might get to the dance class or Saturdays or something like that <laughs> <laughs> there you go so we're gonna take a short break but we want to we want to thank cynthia primus and david goodman for for everything and idea arts we're looking forward to great things from you guys and if you're a funder out there this is where you got to go and this is yeah, where you got to right. invest in right so, Bring that money. Fill it up. One, two, it's about to be lit. Three, four, time to represent. Five, six, it's time right now. Seven, eight, it's about to go down. Nineteen, me and my friends. All of my fam, yeah, all of them. Living world. Hey, that's my jam. Have a party, hey, hop up in the van, cuz right now, you'll be right now. Hey, it's about to go down. Right now, you'll be right now. Hey, so we can shine right now. I'm 
doing these things. Yeah, I might build a house on Mars. We are back. This is Looking Forward Radio, and we're here with Nate Solar. Nate, thank you for being hey. here. And we're going to bring our next guest in. And I, we usually start the show with him because, you know, you start with your biggest, and then you kind of work your way, you know, through it. And right. this time, uh, Lou Narvaez from Pennsylvania Probation and Parole. Lou, you want to come on in? Bring him in the room. He'll be there a second, I think. But Lou is um, head of uh, district director of Pennsylvania Probation and Parole. He's a good fan of the show. And we've had him on um, just almost every episode that we've had yeah. in some form or fashion. Um, Has apparently, Lou been on more than me? Apparently, Lou's not here. He, I know that he usually <laughs> gets on in the beginning, and he might have gotten caught um, oh. because in the beginning of the show. But we'll get him on next week. So he gives All us right. a, a get. He gives us a really rundown of what's going on, probation and parole. But maybe um, it'll give us a minute or two, Nate, for you and I to talk a little about what's happened sure. on the streets. Yeah. So COVID's um, COVID's hitting us hard. On uh, last Friday, I'm sorry. Yeah, last Friday morning, I received a call from um, from a friend who. Um, her son had been working with us for working with me for about a year and a half, two years. And um, he was released from prison about a week and a half ago and um, committed suicide. And oh, wow. I can't tell you how many times, Nate, you've seen it too. How many times over the last few months we've seen people that have been struck by, um, by addiction issues um, coming right. back from prison. Right. Um, COVID? You think COVID's putting it, turning the screws on all that? Yeah. I think that uh, um, having a lot of time and dealing with a lot of the, 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 the stresses of COVID, the, the the employment issues, the just taking care of your family and just dealing with a whole bunch of things and the and the, the losses of loved ones and stuff, it just it wears on people and the fact that we can't really um reach out much or people that don't have good um communicating um necessities as computer computers at home and things of that nature, it it wears on you a lot, man. And it's just the difference the different ways that people cope with things and it's sad. It's really sad. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of it, it is very sad, and we have to um, remain mindful that when people come home, you know, that's the first part, but the next part is helping them when they come home, giving them yeah. that extra push, and looking forward, looking forward reentry program has been active. You guys have been doing a, an unbelievable job at connecting with people as they come home from prison and yeah. trying to navigate all this. I mean, it is it's kind of a mess. It's you know, it's the one thing I don't know that we clearly thought out as a society, you know, right. when we're talking about when getting get, people out of prison, getting people out of prison, but yet we got to do something when they come home and, and be able yes. to support them better. So really the continuum. Yeah, definitely a continuum, but you know, there's good programs out there that are really working to help people and get yes. them back on their feet. So we're excited about that, you know, in this show, part of what we've done is we've also, we've liked to highlight some success stories. So I know that um, a good friend, uh, Sean Hargrove is here and we're going to bring Sean on now, if we can, Sean's been sitting in the waiting room patiently, but Sean is, uh, Sean's going to tell you his story. He's a graduate of the Mural Arts Program, and he also um, is the founder and executive um, of a uh, of a company called Graphic Arts. Um, it's Da Vinci uh, Da Vinci Seven Hundred and Thirty LLC. So cool. he's yeah, he's doing some good stuff. There you go. Hey, Big Sean, hey, Sean. how are you? Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to see you. How you doing? doing? So before I even get to all about you, man, I understand you. Um, you've had a little um addition to your family not long ago. Yeah, I just had a daughter. Uh, I say not too long ago. She was born. Well, she's three months now, actually. Congratulations! So, um, yeah. <laughs> wow, good stuff. How's it feel? So good, you know. Like actually, to be in a position that I am right now, you know, from the long road that I came, you know, I maxed out 2013. Right, right after that, my mom passed 2015, but then for me to get right back on, you know, like I say a sturdy path. So, you know, it's good that I found places like, you know, Neural Arts and then, you know, Rise and a few other places that helped me out. And now I'm with Frontline Dads, you know, I'm working for them. So, you know, and now I'm able to actually give back, you know, I'm a youth advocate plus a community organizer and I still do graphic design and murals, you know, also, but you know, I'm just happy to be in a position I am and not being able to go back to the street. So, you know, all right, let's slow down. Let's slow down. Hold on. So let's make it slow. We got sorry. a lot to tell us. Right so, there. we're going to catch, we're going to, we got plenty of time. We're going to catch it all in. But, Sean, you, you grew up in Philly? Yeah, I grew up in North Philly. Nice town. Nice town. And uh, did you graduate high school? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I also got a college degree. So, I got an associate degree in graphic design and animation. Wow, nice. So when did you when was it that you began to get into trouble and see the inside of a prison cell? 
Um, I say about 2003. Yeah, I found a little area in Montgomery County, and you know, I was in college at the time, and you know, found a way to make a little extra money, and it wasn't a you know a positive thing, but it helped make ends meet. You know, at the position I was in, you know, because it was hard for me to find a job. You know. I like fresh out of high school and I wasn't making the type of money I needed. So, you know, ended up, you know, taking a little negative path. Do what you right. got to do. Right. And then, so you got caught. How long were you away for? Uh, I, from then I got locked up. I say I was fighting my first case at the end of 2003, it was about 2004. I got sent away 2005 and I was in the County. I say to about 2006, they let me come home. I graduated college from um, the work release program. And then I went right back to jail in 2008. And I came home in 2013 when I maxed out. Wow. Wow. Just so, so what was it, Sean? Was it the last bid? Was it in 2013 where you said no mas, no more? Like I got it. I got to figure this out. I got to get right. Enough. Yeah, what, yeah, I said enough is it? enough. And I actually wrote a children's story that I'm working on now. I'm trying to make it into a graphic novel. It's called Enough is Enough. So, you know, and, you know, it kind of like enlightened me and helped me like, you know, like because I didn't have too many positive role models until I got to a prison. That's right. when I met like a lot of people in the state um, in Greaterford, you know, which is now in Phoenix, like and um, SOAR program and all that um, real street talk. And a lot of the brothers that I work with now from Pan and Frontline Dads are actually a lot of my mentors, you know, and they got me on that sturdy path. And I promised them back when I maxed out in 2013 that I wasn't going back. And, you know, I stuck to my promise. So we came home and you came home in 2013. And what was a, what was like the first thing that you did? What did you, um, what, what was the first thing on your bucket list that you had to, you had to get accomplished? Pretty much, you know, getting something to eat. So I ended up at Mac Cheese Steaks. So <laughs> yeah, like there, you there you go. Some real food. There you go. Right. You know, you know what, um, it- going to add the fact that it, it gets to a point sometimes when you when you make bad decisions sometimes we make we're not bad people we make bad decisions and we right. and it, it, be, it become we become accustomed to making those bad decisions and then it gets to a point where it was same was with myself you get to a point you say i'm tired like this is enough enough is enough i i don't see myself continuing this path of going back and forth in and out of prison the recidivism and once something opens up for you which is a good thing like like you said, the programs that opened up for you, and then having a positive role model, because some of the people go in and switch their whole thing around and tell you, don't come back in here. You know what I'm saying? And I think as well as having a mindset to say, I've had enough of this, man. I'm, I'm, I'm done with this. I'm going to put my put my nose to the grindstone and keep on moving. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Right. So, Sean, I'm curious, Sean, when you were in, um, when you were at SCI Phoenix or Greaterford, did you, um, were you doing art? Did you do art behind the walls? Were you right? Were you still drawing oh, and yeah. writing? Well, and that definitely. Kind of um, when I, I did majority of my time in Somerset, and you know, um, in Somerset, I say I did pretty much like I say from 2000, I say the end of 2008, 2009 when I went up, and around 2012, 2013. I was about to get into the pre-release program, but just so happened somebody got, I, I, I guess, that was on pre-release murder, a police officer, and I was home for, I say, no less than six months, and I ended up going right back and maxed out, which I was trying to do initially, but, you know, they sent me to greater for from there, and that's where I maxed out the end of my stint, so I did about a year and a half, almost two years in greater for, but that's when I got into all them actual programs, but when I was in Somerset, I actually was doing like a lot of, I was pretty much an art instructor up there. So I got to do wow. a lot of my artwork and I got to meet a lot of positive people, you know, but it was more people from like the um, lower Highland, Allegheny, you know, Pittsburgh area, whatever, you know, and I wasn't able to connect with the people from Philadelphia until I got back over. That's when I got into mural arts and stuff like that. But, you know, it, it was a blessing though, you know, because I was able to actually clear my mind, you know, be sober, actually think, you know, be like, you know, to actually think, you know, and see it from a different perspective. And I felt like I was back in high school all over again. So, yeah. So you came home and one of the first places you went to was mural arts and you're yeah. graduated the mural arts program. So I'm curious, do, are any murals in the city uh, have your, uh, have your finger, your fingers on them? The one that's right there. Um, front and Gerard. <laughs> Seriously. Front and Gerard. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, yeah so. Right by my house. Yeah. By that garden we, we, thing. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that was the one we was working on right before COVID came, and we were actually able to finish it, you know, like, yeah, i say probably a couple months before it actually hit, so. 
Wow. Congratulations. Good stuff. What would you, I, Miro Arch is a good friend. Um, Jane Golden is a good friend and um, uh, Will Cooper Ballas. I, mean, I know very well. A lot of the yeah, staff there. Guy. Yeah. So tell me like, um, what'd you think of the program? I mean, for me, the program was like, it, it was excellent, you know, and I wish I had more time to spend in there, you know, because like it, it, it gets a lot of people off the street, you know, that actually need a home yeah. that don't actually know where they're headed. So, and I say like, I wish a lot of people were more able to get into it, but like, it's hard, like for like, I, if it wasn't for um Philadelphia probation parole, they got me back into it because I was actually in between jobs working for ShopRite at the time when it actually gave me a position there, you know, that's when I got into the program again, because before that I was just volunteering ever since I've been home from prison, but that's when I actually, you know, pretty much got in touch with you through Will. But um, yeah, I think it is a, a good program, you know, just like how Jeff did, but like for starving artists and people that don't know where, you know, exactly to go or what path they want to do, because a lot of people don't know what to do with their art, you know? So yeah. I think that's, that's a good thing. The, I learned a lot of other things in there also. I wanted to ask a question. Of, um, so you said you worked at ShopRite. Did that program yeah. come through the Rise program? The what, ShopRite? The shop right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I kind it was of Brown ShopRite? ShopRite yeah. worked with Jeff Rise Brown's a good friend, right? too, and they, yeah. they just did some good work, giving people some opportunity to get on their feet. So we're we're excited that you you were there. You kind of were all around. You know, and you've, um, I know uh, we recently met at the Looking Forward office because we're getting some graphic design work done. We're looking at possibly doing right. our windows out front and our new building. And and I know Sean's been working hard to put some um, of his big Da Vinci work together so that we could see his work out in the public. Um, we're going to take a break in a second. But, Sean, I want you to, before but while we're taking a break, I want you to, if you can, you wrote, you sent me something today that I want you to read on air. And you sent me um, a poem. I think it's a poem or a writing called Eradicated. And uh, uh, yeah, it, was, it was one of the pieces that, um, that I wrote when, it, um, when I was in um, Mural Arts. So I, want to, I want you to talk about it, but I, I want you to read it when we get back. So we're going to take a break for a second. You're listening to Looking Forward, WPPM 106. So Y'all ready? Alright, folks. Let's go. I put your hands in the sky when you side to side. We ain't going nowhere. We just waving bye bye. All of the haters, to all the haters, to all of the haters. Say I'll see you later. Let's go. Let's go. Go time, time to be the change. Change. Set the world on fire. Be the flame. Bang. Rise higher, level up, do the thing. Bang. Shine brighter, be a fighter, push through the pain. Place a trail. Send a helping hand, represent, take a stand, change the game, stick it to the plan, hold tight, shine bright, that's who I am, and I don't know though, what you have been told though, all I know though, is going for the gold though, give my all, I'm a heart, I'm a soul though, don't bend, don't break though, now put your hands in the sky, when side to side, when you're going to We are back. You're listening to Looking Forward Radio, yeah. and we got Big Nate Salard in the house, and all Sean, day, all day. Sean Hargrove. Sean, I um, so so much I want to talk to you about, and we're gonna have a little fun in a minute. But um, I I got a uh, a text from you today, and you sent me some photographs, and I'm gonna get them up on the website. We're gonna post them on our site so we can see some of your great artwork. But you sent me something that kind of took me back, and I was wondering if you have it in front of you. Um, you wrote something to call it's called eradicated. I was wondering if you can read it for our audience. Uh, I didn't know you were gonna put me on a spot like that. I am, man. <laughs> I am. It's my job. Come on, yeah, talk well, right. to us. All right, say honestly, all of my to all of my white 
Oh, see, that's why I wasn't prepared. I was hoping you were reading for me, but um, honestly, all of my wife. See, I'm stuttering. So I'll give it to you. Would you be able to I'll, read it? I'll read it. Thank you. Because I'm I'm one of your white friends, so I can do this. Here we go. Right. It says this is this is Sean. Uh, honestly, all my white friends that are close to me from poverty, one way or another, and has seen what it's like to grow up in some form of struggle but they can try to be as sympathetic as empathetic as they want imagine all they want but they can't and won't ever know what it's like to be african-american or black in this world we live in now for my friends that live in the surrounding communities or suburbs they they themselves feel for our people but they also know better than to even present eradicate systematic racism that question to me or any one of my kind because they know for sure that their question is somewhat appalling and very disrespectful and yet inappropriate. There's nothing you could do for me or my people in one day or one year to erase centuries of embedding and brainwashing. I do appreciate the thought of the kind jester, but less is best for me. Just being supportive is good enough. And if you really want to eradicate systemic racism, raise your children to know that all people are born, in this, are born the same. People aren't born racist. They're taught that. They're taught who to hate, who to love, and who and who some people are in the right direction because the world has changed somewhat, but we still have to go have a long way to go. So I'm just I was touched by it. Um, first of all, because I'm one of your white friends. And, <laughs> and and no, I say that in all sincerity. You know, I, I more I really have come to terms with my white privilege, and, and I think a lot of people need to in order to be able to change the the discussion and the dialogue and it really hit home, but I'm curious, when did you write it and what, what prompted it? Uh, one of the people from mirror arts was asking me like, cause I got a lot of white friends, you know, and like, and a lot of people were like, you know, they were, they were actually standing up, I guess, during the black lives matter after the George Floyd thing. So, and it was like, we were just trying to see uh, which way will we go about eradicating, you know, systematic racism. And I was just trying to see like, how would they, you know, actually look at it from a perspective, whatever, you know, and they don't know what it's like to actually be pulled over from a police officer, you know, and we get, um, cause I was talking to my wife's grandmother at the time. And I'm like, we all get different amount of different types of questions when we get pulled over from different type of police officers. And I'm like, you know, so from me being a young black male or, you know, middle aged black male, cause I'm almost 40, but you know, like I would get like, you know, where you going, you know, what you going or what you doing in this neighborhood, this like, cause I live in Sheltenham, you know, and I my, got children in Montgomery County and the questions are always different for different people, you know? Right. And then I was around with one of my white friends one time and they never got the type of question that I got, you know? And then I pretty much, you know, I was asked to write this, like, you know, how do I see, you know, ending away with um, eradicating systematic uh, racism. And I was like, well, you know, I was sitting there talking to one of my friends and, you know, and they were like, wow, you know, I never looked at it like that. And then I got pulled over right after that with him in the passenger seat and he got to see the whole type of different types of questions that I was asked, you know, and hmm. he was like, you know, trying to speak for me from the passenger seat. And he was telling him to shut up because he like, I didn't pull you over. I pulled him over, you know, for the dumbest reason, you know, like asking me where am I going, you know, at this time of night. And I'm like, it was sad, you know, and it hurt me because like, yeah. He just got pulled over with me in the opposite seat. And, you know, that's what made me write it, you know, and it, it pretty much touched home for him. And he was just like, wow. He's like, I never looked at it from your perspective, you know, and I'm like, and he's raising his children the right way. But, you know, a lot of people don't understand, you know, because I was looking at Lorenz Tate um, and he was talking about how he raised his children and, you know, Los Angeles, you know, and them being privileged, you know, from being upper class, you know, instead of middle class and stuff, people, you know, like, and just me having a nice car and being in a certain neighborhood, I get certain questions, you know, and then like, if I make one sudden move, I end up, you know, with bullet holes in me, I could be torn out the car, you know, for the dumbest thing. And then certain things, they'd be like, well, where's the drugs and the guns, whatever, you know? And I'm like, that's the mm -hmm. first question you ask, you know, like if you pulled me over for a, a traffic violation, why are you asking about drugs and weapons? You know, if you pull me over for a stupid citation. Right. Sean, what do you what do you think it is? Like what what is it that that we as a society needs need to do? But besides having this discussion, what do we need to do in order to be able to change the to change the dialogue to um to get people to start thinking differently? Um I know that the first for me is at least acknowledging that it exists. 
that white privilege exists that people you know we are you know you're you're a white guy driving in the suburbs is treated differently than a black guy driving in the suburbs right and that's the and same thing as a, a white person being pulled over in north philly for they're going to ask you is where you buy it from just <laughs> hey you probably wasn't even buying drugs you know you probably right. were just in the wrong place at the wrong time but like why is it always got to be the wrong place wrong time you know if you pull me over for a citation let it be for a citation. Why you got to go do extra questions, you know, like and a certain cop just be picking and choosing or, you know, it's just like, I guess, you know, I, I, I can't even say because like I didn't have so many different scenarios where they turned wrong, whatever. And that's why I'm like, all right, you know, from now on, I just, you know, just abide by the law and just let them go, you know, like try to so just get done with start, it as fast as possible. Does it start with the police, though? I mean, does it start with our law enforcement and the way we handle situations? I or, can't even say, or is it start, I can't even say start that? with with the law enforcement because like some police don't even wake up feeling certain ways, whatever. It's just like they have certain talks in their locker room or their little uh, room before they got on the street about how they go about certain things. But no, it's upbringing. And I guess, you know, some people just feel they're like, all right, this person might have more money, whatever, you know, someone pick with them, see if I can push their buttons, whatever, because they might be having something in the car that they're not supposed to have. But like, that's not even the reason why you pull them over. It's just like, I don't know what goes through people's minds at certain times. They just feel like, you know, they got that power of authority. Like, you know, how to, like even from being in prison, just from you being white, like, you know how certain people treat certain people. So, yeah. so, so what say. You say, let me yeah, let me man. say this real quick, because uh, it starts at home first. But the, the right. most important thing is with the police, because those are the, those are the those are the people that are killing us for the most part. But I just saw I just saw an article where a black couple had a house, put four hundred thousand dollars worth of renovation in it. And when they tried to sell it, they tried to put them five hundred thousand dollars less than what the house was valued at they got a white friend to go in to sell the house and the house went for five hundred thousand dollars more so it's, it's really the upbringing because the police play a part in it there are people in all types of positions that you may need in some situations or to get grants or whatever the case may be and they'll treat you differently because of race so it, it doesn't start with the police but the police play a major part because our our young people our young black men and women are dying because of at the hands of the police more so than anything else because of racism. So one of the things that um, the and the reason why I wanted you on the show, Sean, to be honest, is that, you know, uh, when we talk about um, when we talk about art, um, one of the most incredible things about art is the fact that when you look at a picture, it's not black or white. Um, it's whatever the artist has project, whatever they project. And I was away in prison with some guys that did some absolutely incredible pictures and were so talented in the work that they did. And when you looked at that, it wasn't about um, I didn't you don't see color. You see passion. All. You see what's in their heart. You see what message they're trying to get out. And exactly. you know, sometimes you see a lot it's about, of films. Yeah. Like, uh, I, I, like cause all of my daughters are artists, you know, from my oldest to my youngest. They love art. And like me and my therapist, you know, because I'm also a CPS, but my therapist is one of my close friends also. And like, you know, I do like I say an arts and craft, you know, with my children, every like at least once a week, you know, where I sit there and I paint and draw with them, you know. But like I can see their moods in art. Like you said, you don't see color art because like it's plenty of times when I was doing, you know, art with a whole bunch of children, whatever. Like I can see their mood or what's going on at home in their art. You know, like you can tell if they're depressed. You can tell if they up, if they down, or whatever. And like, like I was saying earlier, and just like I said in erratic, it like it starts at home. It starts with how you treat your, or raise your yeah. children. You right. know, like cause it's pretty much going to show. You know, just like how somebody can take their bad mood from home to work with them. Like it shows at home. Yeah. So you know, it, it that's where it pretty much it start at, and that's where it can end at. Art is the one right. thing. It's art is is incredible. It's the one thing that I found is a great way of communicating. I, and I want, I'm going to post some of your pictures and the work that you've done. But there's got to be a sense that when you're um, when you're doing some drawings and you're doing paintings and you're working on your whether it's your laptop or your easel, um, that there's just this um, sense of uh, just like you're kind of just into yourself. You're in that zone. You know, it's like we, it's like when Michael Jordan's in that zone and he can't miss them. You know, when an artist is in that zone, only thing he's thinking about is like what he's you know, what he's painting, what he's putting, what he's trying to get people to, to listen to. And absolutely. It, and it's that story. So I, I was told once when I got into prison that your life is like a painting and that everything, mm. decision you make, every choice you make is just another brush another stroke. Brush, right. Yeah. Let me, and, let and let me say said, this. Oh, I'm sorry, Jeff. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Because uh, I was going to say that uh, um, the art situation, 
is 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 definitely a a, a way that a, that people can relate. It's like music; people relate to it in a way that it's it's what you like, or what you don't like, or what you start to like, or what you find interesting, whatever the case. And just on another side note, you say you and your therapist are friends. Jeff used to be my therapist, but I started to question some of the stuff he told me. To do. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're gonna do this. So I, I know I'm gonna we're gonna do this on radio, but that's okay because I know you can't really see it unless you're on Streamyard. But Sean, I want I went and I saved some stuff when I left prison. I was able to take some of my drawings with me. So you're an artist. I respect your opinion, and I want you to give me what you think about the art that I did. Okay, so here's the first right. one. Uh, Matt. I'm judging it too. Right. So <laughs> this is the first painting. This is the first painting I did in prison. And the guy said, start slow, man. Just start with straight lines. <laughs> right? So it, here are my straight lines. Oh, that's beautiful. That's I, not I, bad. I like Jeff, it. Jeff, you did that? I did that. Didn't that's that great. Nice. I liked it. I saw that at your house. Yeah. No. Did you? <laughs> I, I buried what, what, what it. Did Wait, wait. So here's the second one I got. So it was just a bunch of lo- it's just a bunch you of lines. That, Jeff. Here's the second one I got. You, know, you, you you're regular Picasso, okay? Oh. All right. So here, so here's the third one. So I decided that I wanted to get really sly. So I decided I was going to take a Matisse. So if you guys are ever down in the Barnes in the Barnes Foundation down here on um on Franklin Parkway, if you go in there, um, they have this Matisse exhibit and they have one of his paintings. And this is actually one of Matisse's paintings. That's hot, and I, I totally copied it, and, and you know just so it's it's um it's up on top in the in the Matisse room, one of the Matisse rooms. It goes all the way across the top. It's got these arches on it and these real erotic pictures. And guys made a lot of fun of me. A lot of I got a lot of crap inside of prison <laughs> for that one, but that ain't hot though. But I'm yeah, gonna tell you, you, what's that? You really drew them pictures? I did. They, those are my yeah, work. That, it's, my, it's all me. That, that was good. Yeah, yeah that gallery. Yeah. So. A white Jewish lawyer who can not only paint but has a radio show and can drive a forklift. Man, I got it all going. Great <laughs> right, jack of all trades like me, huh? That's what happens when you get hey, you to see prison. You see so you already see I can do a million things. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised. That's good, Jeff. There you go. I drew the picture stuff. behind me. I drew this picture behind me. I drew that. Uh, yeah, the Eagles banner. So, Sean, what's next <laughs> What's next for you, Sean? What's next on your on your radar screen? Man, I'm I'm just trying to have like my art displayed in a gallery. That's that's pretty much been one of my dreams. And you know, like I, I already became a, a wonderful tattoo artist. You know, I had a tattoo parlor. I lost that 2008 when I finally went upstate. You know, and I say uh, right now, it's just like put my I want my work to be displayed through the world. You know, I want somebody to actually like be able to like, all right, I pay this amount for this amount. You know, like instead of you know the jail biz where it's only, I'm getting this amount of suits for it. If I was able to make hundreds of right. dollars and thousands of dollars in prison, you know, like I know out in the world, I know I can make a lot. So there you, you go. Know, well, like, wish you right. all the best. Wish you and, and, and uh, give those girls a big hug for me and, and uh, congratulations on the newest edition and the best to you and your wife. It's Da Vinci 730 LLC, uh, Sean Hargrove. If you're trying to reach him, you want to reach the show, we'll give you all his contact information. Sean, you want to give something out so people can get hold of you? Yeah, I would say you can just reach me at uh, BigDaVinci13, you know, at gmail.com if you're trying to reach out to me. Um, I sent you a few things, um, a few slides of my artwork that just color pencil, but I got paint as well, so I wasn't able. We just came back in from Delaware, so I was able to, you know, like take a picture of a few things and a few things that I had from your art. That's what I sent you in the email, but whatever you can display for me, you know, like that is definitely a help. And I'm waiting for it. To, um, look, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting my looking forward logo displayed <laughs> to the world. So, you know, the world can see, you know, what I can do. So, you know, there you go. we love it. We love it. Thanks, hey, Sean. Thank so you very Sean, much listen, for Sean you, being here. Nate? When you hook that, when you hook that logo up, regardless of what's being said to you, make sure you can put my face on like the side yeah, of it. Yeah. That ain't oh, happening. Already on it. That ain't happening. <laughs> I got you. Uh, well, we got a minute or two left, and before we go uh, for today's show, I want to end up with some things that are going on in the in the world. Um, a few good things that you should know. Uh, one is our friends at um, the Energy Coordinating Agency at ECA have partnered in a new program. It's a, it's a retrofit installer technician training. I'll say that again. It's a retrofit installer technician training program. It starts March 26 and goes through July. And you're given a $400 a week stipend and set to travel. You're given a laptop for virtual learning. Man, this has everything built right oh, into good. it. And it's a great training opportunity. So if you're interested, uh, reach out to Eva Ortiz at ECA. Uh, it's Eva Ortiz at uh, it's 215 609 
1457. If you're interested in the green retrofit installer technician training program, it's by ECA and Philadelphia Energy Authority. We're really excited about that. Um, last week on Channel 3, uh, CBS News published a Philly gun violence resource list. And if you're having any issues of gun violence in your neighborhood, you want to figure out what steps can we take, um, get online. It's through um, Philly CBS Philly. Uh, Philly gun violence resource list is online. You can get it. It has all the resources, organizations that are doing some work in this space that you might want to reach out to uh, that, that can give you a hand. Um, a few things you should know. One is that Pennsylvania passed a law recently that if you're homeless and you need an identification card, it is now free. It is now free in the Commonwealth. So if you're homeless, just go into a Pennsylvania Department of Transportation office or go online if you have somebody that can get you the application. And you can fill out the application, take it with, um, take it to a, a, a PennDOT agency, and um, now just tell them that you're homeless and you, you can't afford to pay for the application. Um, the identification, and they'll uh, they'll hand you the application to fill out and make sure that it's completed. Um, Jevs has uh, reentry virtual workshops are continuing. Uh, they're every they're just about every day, Tuesday through Thursday. Actually, on Monday and Friday we meet with clients, but on Tuesday through Thursdays there's a bunch of uh, great classes. On Monday night there's a business startup class that I'm running, and we are um, one last note is that we have a new partner called United Unity Recovery and Unity Recovery is doing some great stuff with actually helping people uh, with mindfulness and yoga and really trying to figure out any challenges they have with addiction. So we're going to try and highlight a special agency every week. Uh, Unity Recovery can be contacted at contact at unityrecovery.org or just Google Unity Recovery here in Philadelphia. And they have programs that will help you if you're having some challenges with addictions, uh, you want to get into a mindfulness program, a uh, whole host of opportunities that you can get into. So Unity Recovery, check it out. So I am exhausted, but a big thank you to all of our guests. Obviously, yeah. Nate Salar for co-hosting today. Uh, Mr. Narvaez, we're, we're giving a shout-out to Mr. Narvaez, although he didn't make it in. We'll get him next week. Right. Nate? Yeah, we're saying uh, thanks to everybody for coming out. I appreciate your work, um, Sean. Um, thank you. Thank look you. Look forward to seeing the mural and everything, and I would say happy Black History Month. There you go. Happy Black History Month. And also a shout out to our, our two other guests that were on today, Cynthia Primus and uh, David Goodman of Idea Arts. Um, congratulations. Great program over there. We're looking forward to seeing yeah. you uh, going over there, maybe doing a remote broadcast from there someday. So a big yeah. shout out to Charlie Clark, who's our who's behind the scenes today, getting everybody in and out and Thanks, doing Charlie. all the transition work. Charlie, thank you so much for a great show. And this is Looking Forward Philadelphia, and we'll see you in a few weeks. Take care, everybody. All right. Have a good one. Correct. go this is wppm 106.5 fm and thank you charlie